This is Duke University. Well, today we have the benefit of a stellar panel. Uh, to set the stage, I want to introduce our moderator, uh, Donna Lisker. As Duke's Associate Vice Provost for Undergraduate Education, Donna knows the higher ed landscape, and I might point out, as a standout on her college's rowing team, she will be sure to keep our conversation on a strong trajectory. Absolutely. Donna. Thanks, Bob. Um, I'd like to add my welcome to both everyone here and to those who are watching this via the webcast. We wish you were here. The weather's very nice. Um, I'm going to do really abbreviated introductions, and I'll refer you to your program for the full, um, the full introduction if you'd like to see it. The way we're going to operate is that each of our three panelists is going to make a brief opening statement. I've said six to eight minutes. Then we'll have a little bit of time for them to communicate with one another based on what they've heard, and then we'll open it up to questions. We are really committed to making sure that there's some Q&A time, so um, be sure to keep notes as you listen, and, and we'll have time to explore that. So um, starting to my far right, Andy Rosen, who graduated in 1982 and is the parent of a first-year student, class of 2015, is chairman and CEO of Kaplan Inc., which is among the world's largest and most diverse education organizations. Throughout his two-decade career at Kaplan, Andy Rosen has helped pioneer much of the company's innovation and growth. He's the author of the recently published book, Change.edu, Rebooting for the New Talent Economy, which I believe is available at the Gothic. And in addition to Duke, he also graduated from Yale Law. Next to Andy is Laurie Patton. She, for our great good fortune, became Dean of Arts and Sciences and Professor of Religion at Duke not quite a year ago, July 2011. She came to us from Emory, where she was the Charles Howard Candler Professor of Religions, and she directed there Emory Center for Faculty Development and Excellence. Lori graduated from Harvard and earned her PhD in History of Religions from the University of Chicago. She's the author or editor of eight books on South Asian history, culture, and religion, in addition to many articles and translations. And finally, to my immediate right is George Leaf, who graduated from our law school in 77 and is parent of a 2011 grad. George is a director of research for the John Williams Pope Center for Higher Education Policy, which is a nonprofit institute dedicated to improving higher education in North Carolina and the nation. He was a vice president of the John Locke Foundation and before it became an independent entity in 2003, director of the Pope Center. He's also widely published and is the author of Free Choice for Workers, A History of the Right to Work Movement, and he's editor of Educating Teachers, The Best Minds Speak Out. So with that, I'm going to ask Andy to start, and then we will just make our way down the table. Okay. Thanks, Donna, and thank you all for being here. You know, it's easy to come to the Duke campus and feel like everything is just great about American higher education. <laughs> you know, you, you see these great students and engaged and interesting faculty and a campus that gets more and more spectacular every year. But... Uh, Duke serves about 6,500 undergrads and 8,200 graduate students out of a national student population of 21 million. Uh, since I went to Duke, the population uh, in American higher education has risen by 8 million students, and Duke undergraduates have accounted for all of 700 of those. And the Duke students do not look like traditional, <laughs> what is now traditional higher education students, because a typical student now looks is more likely to look like a you know 33-year-old um, single mom who's trying to get a better job than a 19-year-old at a Dalton. So if you think about the challenges that our economy faces, and keep in mind that a third of American adults have a bachelor's degree, that's it, and yet 60% of our jobs require college. Duke, as great as it is for the small number of people who come here, is not uh, serving the main problem in American education, which is access. And the institutions that, the, the sort of broad massive institutions that are trying to serve that problem uh, have some pretty rough facts going for them. First, costs are going up stratospherically. And debt is going up with it. So a lot of you may have read, student debt now um, is in excess of a trillion dollars in this country. And it has to be said, Duke is part of this problem. You know, I'm here for my 30th reunion. When I was here, a Duke experience, and that includes you know, the tuition, the dorm, the, the you know, meals at the pits, costs less than $5,000. For my daughter, uh, who's a freshman here, it's close to $60,000. Mm -hmm. 
So over that period, the cost of living has a little more than doubled, but the cost of a Duke education has gone up by 12 times. Now, is education 12 times better? I think we have the perfect people to answer that question in Lori and Donna, and I'm not going to try. Uh, but what I can, at least for Duke, but what I can say is the evidence across American higher education uh, suggests that students are actually learning less today than they did a generation ago. And a lot of that is because in a lot of institutions, the academic rigor has been reduced. So there was a recent study in which students reported, or a third of students reported that they study less than five hours a week. And half of students said they had not taken a course in the previous semester, which required more than 20 pages of writing. So it's not a surprise that graduation rates at four-year institutions in the United States has gone down to about the 50% mark. And only about a quarter of students graduate from community colleges. So we've got uh, costs that are going up and productivity you know, and, and results, academic results, that are at best staying even and probably going down. Where else in the American economy do we find a reduction in productivity like that? This is, uh, this is going to become, if it's not already, this is a crisis in America. Remember, the United States spends more than twice uh, it, the percentage of GDP on, edu on higher education as any other country in the world, and yet it keeps on slipping in attainment from first to 16th. So we've got a problem that's gonna weigh on our economy for a long time to come. Now, in my book I talk about how we got here and what we can do to fix it, but I wanna just give you one example for today. And it's from just down the road. It's a, a school called High Point University. Now, outside of, uh, you know, North Carolina, you know, not many people have heard of it. It's one of those classic, sleepy, you know, uh, it's on, on the web, a fine um, institution. But, you know, one of these liberal arts schools that a lot of people uh, don't know about. But it is rocketing in prestige and popularity right now. And that's because in 2006, they brought in a new president. And the new president unleashed a $468 million spending spree. And this is a school with fewer than 2,000 students. Now, he didn't spend it on classrooms or faculty or laboratories. He spent it, for the most part, on an incredible, beautiful new university union, wonderful new dorms, a new steakhouse, a new movie theater, a swimming pool, and so on. He modeled his plan for High Point expressly on resorts like Disney or High Point, or, or um, Disney or, or Ritz Carlton. And surprisingly enough, 17-year-olds like the idea of a four-year resort experience. And so the school is being flooded with applications. So, so much so that they've tripled the size of the freshman class. They can be more selective, so SAT scores have gone up by uh, 100 points, and they've increased tuition by 100 points. Now all of the schools in the area are scrambling to increase their amenities to compete with high point. Same education, higher cost. Now, the irony of all this is, as Bob was just saying, there have never been more disruptors in the world of higher education, or at least potential disruptors. So you talked about the Stanford class, but you know, if you want to take a Duke class, or anybody in the world wants to take a Duke class, you can do so for free with the OpenCourseWare Consortium or an iTunes U. If you want to learn algebra for free, just go to Khan, uh, Khan Academy. Or you know, private sector institutions like the ones that, that uh, Kaplan runs offer a moderately priced uh, ed degree program uh, for students that has much better academic outcomes than the rest of American higher education for a comparable student demographic. So you'd think that the market is getting ready to solve this problem. But innovation is hard in higher education. Uh, regulators and accreditors work very hard to crush innovation. And this is, there's, there's a long history of this. In the 19th century, the land-grant universities were the new players on the scene, but they were dismissed as pretenders to the title of university, you know, just sort of ridiculed as an extended high school. In the 20th century, community colleges were, view, were described as service stations for the American public. And more recently, private sector institutions, for-profit uh, institutions, have been attacked for their quality and legitimacy. But uh, and challenged by regulatory and accredi accreditation authorities that were established by those who love the system that we have now. So it's very hard for innovation to flourish in the higher education world that we have. 
But things will change. They have to. Because if the costs go up over the next 25 years, the way they have over the last 25 years, and I should note that they've been, uh, costs have been increasing at an increasing rate, but if they just go up at the same rate, then there are going to be a steady drumbeat of schools, including Duke, whose tuition for a four-year degree will be over a million dollars. Now, it may be that Duke can find students who are, you know, and families who are willing to spend a million dollars on a degree. There are some other schools who will, you know, be far enough up, up the mountain to be able to withstand that. But it's not sustainable for most of higher education. Somewhere between here and there, we will finally recognize that we are facing a crisis in higher education. And at that point, we'll start to embrace the innovation that can change uh, the way our higher education system works. And the real question is, when do we do that? When do we start to accept that? Because the determination of when we accept that we have a problem that we have to deal with will determine whether American higher education, and ultimately with it the American economy, continues to lead the world in the decades ahead. Thank you, Andy. We'll turn to Laurie now. OK, so um, I, I begin with a story. Uh, I was part of an administrative training uh, of w women in higher administrative positions at Wellesley College. And it was a very uh, interesting moment. We had several women college presidents come through um, to talk about their experience. And uh, they were from community colleges. They were from land grant universities. They were from a number of different places. Um, and there was this very interesting moment when uh, one of the most, I'd say, charismatic uh, leaders of one of our workshops, who had been president of um, Eastern Michigan State and uh, California Long Beach um, said something I think very, very important, which is you need to figure out, each university needs to figure out what its relationship to its publics is. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of builds on, on what you were saying, that there is a way in which, um, depending on who we are, um, whether we're state, whether we're land great, whether we're community, whether we're private research, whether we're private liberal arts, whether we're religious based, there's going to be a different relationship to and different set of accountabilities to our publics. And I think one of the things that we continue to not do well, and they need, we need to do much, much better, um, is to figure out what that relationship is. Um, we have some wonderful publics uh, from Duke University sitting here in this room called alumni. Uh, and we are doing so much better in terms of our lateral relationships with both the Duke community and, and broadly. But I think in general, whatever kind of university you are, you need to do some careful thinking about not only thinking about educational partnerships with your publics, but also uh, financial partnerships with your publics and research partnerships with your publics. Um, to me, because I absolutely agree that, that the sustainability question is the number one question that we face in higher education today, it's going to have to be a different financial partnership with our publics. That is what has to get reconfigured. Um, and if you are going to be thinking about, for instance, in a private elite research university, which there are very few, um, and uh, you're absolutely right that it, it the, the, that our percentage of change is uh, very small, and we don't represent the, the broader landscape of higher education. But if we did that, we're going to have to accept the fact that we are a combination of a research outfit, a foundation, a company, and a nonprofit. If we actually just look at the models upon which we operate within a university, and how can we maintain our commitment to our educational mission and remember that we're working with all those financial models at once. I think that is the key thing. How do we negotiate multiple financial models within a university and do so in a much more vibrant relationship with our publics? Um, what that means for a place like Duke is, um, you may or may not know, but um, we are $54,000 per year. Um, it's a thing that horrifies every administrator trying to figure out how do we um, negotiate this, keep the cap on it, and yet, you know, every market research that I know of says that if we went down to $10,000 a year and advertised that, our brand value would go down. So how are we figuring out that? Um, but we have the average grant for financial aid for undergrads is 36 k so our cost is actually 54 minus 36. So uh, it's a very different kind of question. But why are we able to do that? 
um, partly because we had a massive financial aid campaign um, several years ago. Many of you probably participated, for which we thank you. Um, and we also are continuing to bolster in greater and greater numbers our financial aid support. Um, we cannot continue even at the level we are. If we stayed, w tuition stayed absolutely flat and room and board stayed absolutely flat, we still would be tilting about $5 million a year just for financial aid. Um, what that means to me, given that I'm deeply committed to this kind of education, um, is that we have to figure out a very, very different and more robust relationship to what financial aid is. Um, and I think Duke has done a, a wonderful job with that. But that's going to look different for a private liberal arts college. Um, Oberlin is creating a very different model for how it relates to its community and actually creating different financial partnerships with people in the town in which Oberlin resides um, looking for financial sustainability. Um, uh, religious communities, um, same kind of question. And of course, um, the ongoing, very complex relationship between state universities and legislators. Um, that, I think, is, is also shifting. And I would say if there's ever, if there's a, the most volatile conversation right now is going on in that sector uh, in terms of the constant uh, back and forth between what legislators need and whether, in fact, um, quasi-private status is the better way for many state universities to go. Um, so I think that would be one way to rethink um, and address some of the key things that, that you're raising. Um, another thing that I might want to suggest, though, the three words that I think about a lot in terms of the future of higher education, um, that all constituencies, whether they're professors, students, um, alumni, faculty uh, of all kinds, uh, as well as staff, um, those three words uh, are integration, adaptation, and innovation. Um, and I think for each of those, words, there are mandates for 21st century liberal education. Um, we don't do a very good job of integrating our knowledge into the rest of the world, and if we did, I think we could create better financial partnerships, obviously with corporate America. Um, innovation, same exact thing. Some of our R&D actually looks like, wow, let me be in my lab, but then check out to see if a company wants what we need. Could we have much more vibrant com conversations with corporations where, while we don't go so far as to become R&D arms of that corporation, we still know what they need and think a little bit better about how we might gear our li labs in that direction? Um, and adaptation. And here, I think there's some very interesting models that we might want to think about. Um, the first is that um, we now are looking at a number of, in, of different um, pedagogical delivery tools, if you want to put a very utilitarian frame on it, um, that will be committed to um, free uh, courses. But, it, it, and the interesting thing here is that I think you, uh, most educators um, might be committed to the idea that knowledge should be shared, either low cost, no cost, affordable cost. Um, the question of credentials is a whole other question, and that uh, is where cost comes in. And I think sometimes those, those two concepts are confused in the, in the debate in higher education. Um, but one of the things that I've noticed is that when we have free delivery of certain kinds of educational content on the web, online, through Skype, and so on, um, and even when we are thinking about something that's uh, very hot at Duke right now, the flipped classroom, where a lot of our delivery of educational content, such as lectures and so on, um, would not happen here, but you'd actually capture it think about it at home, think about it in your dorm room, and then come only to class to work in small group problem-solving environments. Um, that kind of educational content is actually producing more traditional forms of education. We're going back to more traditional forms of education as a result. Um, so what we're seeing more and more is uh, that um, students actually pay for three things. They pay for relationships, they pay for they pay for place, and they pay for experience. And if we can find a way to develop educational methods that are adaptive enough that those three uh, learning contexts are always in place, we're going to be in good shape. Um, one of the things that I've very much noticed about the flipped classroom is that students overall learn not just content better, 
They learn it slightly better than a regular lecture class. But when they are responsible for learning content and know that every class is going to be in small groups with a mentor, with teams, in which they apply the knowledge they, they have learned the night before, they are um, also, and our recent study at Duke shows this, far more able to integrate critical perspectives that are different than their own and respond to critical perspectives that are different than their own. The control study we did with a traditionally taught lecture class and one we did with the flipped classroom um, suggested that this was the number one skill they learned. So this is technology actually helping us um, and once w uh, to, to, to return to something highly traditional, um, but in um, a really unique and innovative way. And uh, I think once we learn how to scale it well, this is the, exactly the kind of thing that will be low cost delivery, but transformative uh, in a very important way. And I, Don is about to give me a piece of paper, so I'll stop Same. there. Lots Thank more to say. You. Thank you, well, we'll come back. Yeah. And finally, George. Uh, thank you, Donna, and also thanks to Bob for organizing this fine event that hits on two of the issues the Pope Center writes on all the time, and also publishing lots of my letters over the year to the alumni magazine. <laughs> well, notwithstanding my law degree, uh, I've been involved with higher education for most of my post-Duke life. I had a teaching career that spanned the decade of the 80s and the last 13 years with the Pope Center for Higher Education Policy over in Raleigh. Now, back when I began teaching, I started to harbor the suspicion, as I saw what my students were like, that America had oversold higher education. And I am now absolutely certain that that is the case. In fact, in 2006, I wrote, and this paper is published on our website, uh, the paper is titled The Overselling of Higher Education. And if you want to read it, you can find it at popecenter.org. Now, the sad truth is that a very large percentage of students who enter college these days, and it's been this way for decades, are neither prepared for nor the least bit interested in serious academic work. Many of them coast through college. They add little or nothing to their stock of skills and knowledge over their uh, four or more years. And then, if they obtain a degree, and many of them never do, they find themselves in a labor market that is already saturated with people who have college credentials, and increasingly large numbers of them spill over into occupational fields that don't call for the least bit of academic study whatsoever. Now, there are, of course, many counterexamples. For example, my older son graduated from Duke with a dual major, biology and math, last spring. I know for sure that he gained a great deal in augmenting his human capital. He learned a lot during his four years here. Unfortunately, for every student like my son, there are several others who are academically adrift. Now, that is the title of a book that was published last year by two sociologists who studied the data and came to the conclusion that many, a large percentage, of the students who go through college in America learn essentially nothing. They add nothing to their cognitive abilities in all the time they spend in college. Now, that's the, the learning side of the problem. What about the cost side? Well, that's well known, and Andy pointed this out, no need to go over data. Costs have been rising dramatically over the years. Now, part of the reason for that is that government keeps trying to make college more affordable and therefore make student aid more generous. But the trouble there, of course, is that college officials are smart enough to figure out that they can capture a good deal of those dollars by raising tuition and fees. But there's also another reason. That's not the sole reason. Another reason why tuition keeps going up is that America has become a far wealthier country over the last several decades. And here the tax code comes into play. Suppose you're a grandparent with a lot of wealth. If you just want to give money to your grandchildren, gift taxes kick in fairly early. Ah, but if you want to buy them prestigious college educations, no taxes kick in. And therefore we find lots and lots of money flowing out of such accounts and into places like Duke and Harvard and Princeton. Now, because we have such a huge array of colleges and universities in America, ranging from the very inexpensive community colleges, where you can go for very, very little cost, to the most expensive private universities, 
Very few people are totally priced out of the market. The trouble, rather, is that the cost of education is rising so much faster than the actual benefit of the educational component of what they're paying for. Now, in a paper that we published in 2009, economist Robert Martin noted that American schools are caught up in what he called the revenue-to-cost spiral. That is to say, they devote far more of their efforts to raising more money and then spending it than they do to trying to improve efficiency and enhance their educational offerings. <clears throat> what we find ourselves in, therefore, is sort of an arms race, uh, High Point is part of this arms race, of amenities and quest for prestige that does nothing to improve education. So if you put together the rising cost of education with the decreasing effectiveness of college education in preparing people for and helping them obtain good employment, you see that we have an unsustainable situation. Uh, many observers have drawn an analogy between our higher ed situation and the housing bubble, and I think that's a very, very strong analogy. Now, that is all the bad news. The good news is that dramatic change is no longer just over the horizon, but it's actually heading our way like a fast-moving weather front. And this is good news for students and their families. It is not such good news for institutions that are going to have to adapt, kind of like the dinosaurs had to adapt after the meteor hit. It's going to be something like that. Now, you've probably read about this impending revolution. Andy's book covers it. And there's a lot, there's quite a, quite a literature these days that's piling up on what's happening or about to happen in higher education. I'll mention a few other books that I would recommend. A book called DIYU by Anya Kamenetz. The book The Innovators University by Clayton Christensen and Henry Eyring. Uh, Unlocking the Gates by Taylor Walsh. Uh, and Georgia Tech's Richard DeMillo has written a stunningly wonderful book entitled Abelard to Apple. And I recommend all, that you read those books, some or all of them. Now, a friend of mine up at the American Enterprise Institute, Andrew Kelly, who's one of their educational fellows, refers to the great disruption in American higher education. And he says this great disruption, it's, it's on its way, it's already happened, it's started, and he dates uh, this to late 2011, with two events in particular. One of them was the, the MOOC, Massive Open Online Course, offered by those two Stanford professors, for which they got something like 190,000 applicants and awarded 23,000 certificates for people who completed the course and demonstrated their knowledge. That's one thing that's happening. MOOCs. In fact, uh, almost every day I come across more stuff about MOOCs and uh, what's happening on the, the cutting edge of change. Here's a piece in Inside Higher Education from two days ago. Princeton Penn in Michigan joined the MOOC party. So more elite schools are going to be offering these massive open online courses. Now the other big event that Andrew Kelly pointed to was MITx. For about a decade now, MIT has offered all of its courses online to anyone who felt like studying what MIT students study. Now, the big thing, though, is that they're now going to offer certification to people who can prove that they know the stuff in those MIT courses. And it's not going to cost very much. So this opens up an entirely new vista for American students. If you want to, if you're good at math and science and want to prove your capabilities, MITx, cheap, affordable, and who could call for better credentialing than the fact that you've completed that kind of work? Now, this revolution is not just going to hit for people who can do Stanford and MIT kind of work, though. It's also going to affect students all the way down who just want to show they have some basic competencies. Um, and, and again, the burgeoning literature on this, in the uh, April 13th Chronicle of Our Education, another friend of mine, Kevin Carey, who's my counterpart at a Washington higher ed think tank, writes about a future full of badges. Now what he's talking about here is a, is a new movement whereby colleges and universities are offering not your traditional courses and degrees, but badges that will be independently certified. 
study the material, and then you get independent certification that you've mastered it. And this is going to take place all over the waterfront in education. He mentions just uh, one of the, the latest, uh, the first of these, these breakthroughs. Um, he writes, the uh, John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, Mozilla, uh, is sponsoring a competition for the development of digital open badges. And the first winners were announced last month. One of them was UC Davis Sustainable Agriculture Program. What's a digital badge exactly? The MacArthur Foundation says it's a validated indicator of accomplishment, skill, quality, or interest. Kevin Carey goes on to say, instead of being built around major requirements and degrees and standard three-credit three courses, the Davis badge system is based on the Sustainable Agriculture Program's core competencies, systems thinking, for example. So what's going to take place at a rapid uh, pace, I believe, is that as employers figure out that having these badges and certifications tells them much, much more about an applicant's qualifications and knowledge than do the standard old bachelor's degrees and even BS degrees. They're going to switch, uh, quickly switch in this direction and human resources people will be told, stop screening people out just because they don't have college degrees, but look for evidence like these badges and certifications and portfolios that people will present to them. So this is what's going to change the landscape of higher education dramatically and quickly. Every college and university is going to have to adapt to this new environment. Duke and all those lesser universities like Harvard and UNC, <laughs> they're all going to have to adapt, and it's going to be fascinating to see what happens. Okay. Thank you. Um, so uh, we want to give just a few minutes for the panelists to be in dialogue with one another, probably no more than 10 minutes maximum, so we have some time for Q&A. I know as I listened to the three panelists, I heard cross-cutting themes of affordability and student debt, access, the value of an education such as the one Duke offers or other schools offer, and do employers recognize that and value it? Um, technology, the impact technology will have, and how we innovate and what uh, barriers there are to innovation. So. Um, we don't necessarily have to be formal about this, but if anyone wa would like to go ahead and respond to something that you heard from someone else, Lori? Yeah, just a, a couple of really important things to add, I think. The first is that um, I think that um, if we do not as, uh, if we think of ourselves as nonprofits and committed to a nonprofit mission, um, if we don't pay simultaneous attention to educational efficiency mm -hmm. as well as educational core values, we're going to have a rough time of it. And I think that would be one broad way of pulling together what, what's been said today. Um, and, and what's interesting is that recent studies of NGOs um, done by Pew and a couple of other places suggest that NGOs are getting more efficient in thinking about the best way to meet their core mission. Um, so I want to make sure that you know, I, what I take from the critiques that are out there, and the very important critiques that are out there, um, is not necessarily to equate profit with and for profit with efficiency. Sometimes that's true, absolutely, and history will show us that. But it's not always the case. And what I think is a wonderful thing about the edginess and the edgy conversations today is that it's forcing NGOs uh, and nonprofits in a number of different sectors to be more efficient. Um, secondly, what's interesting about this is as this conversation is going on about bundling, um, about badges and all sorts of things, liberal arts experiences, relationships, place, experience, those three things which are the holistic thing that we know that people like paying for, um, even as there are critiques about educational outcomes, are the um, U.S.'s number one export, educational export to places like China and India. Um, so there's this really interesting conversation going on where um, as we begin to think about that holistic experience, um, there's a broader global uh, sensibility which is embracing a certain understanding of the liberal arts with very different uh, quality. Uh, the, the quality of these kind of liberal arts pop-ups varies in, in some very interesting ways. Um, I think the, the question of the MITx and, and the Stanford initiative and so on is quite interesting. Um, Duke has had some very serious conversations about jumping into the MOOC pool, as you put it. And um, I think we, I have no idea whether we will. Um, 
tomorrow, but I think we will probably very soon. I think it's a kind of inevitable tide. Um, the key thing, though, that everyone is noticing, including folks at MIT and Stanford and so on, is that branding and offering a certain kind of brand that you know the, that Duke would be famous for or Stanford would be famous for is where you're going to get the most buy-in. Um, and so I think it will really force schools to figure out, as they are already doing, what we're good at, um, what we're not so good at, and where we have to cut as a result of not being able to, to push in a particular direction. Um, and the final thing I'd say is learning outcomes is a big theme um, for everyone on this panel. Um, and one of the things that I think is real important, um, you noticed in David Brooks' comments today, as well as a wonderful book I would recommend, David Feldman and Robert Archibald, um, Why Does College Education Cost So Much, um, is that um, students now, as well as professors, are um, in their own way looking at learning outcomes and thinking differently about evaluation. And I think that's where you're going to get a lot of um, push, not only from the outside um, and the market and, and the things that we've been talking about today, but when faculty um, start to drive their own uh, sense of what a good learning outcome can be, and we're seeing that happen in a very dramatic way this year here at Duke, um, you're going to see some really important results that I think will respond to some of the very uh, strong and, and legitimate critiques that we've heard. Um, I would just say, you know, uh, George said the university is going to have to adapt like the dinosaurs adapted. The dinosaurs actually didn't adapt. That was <laughs> the problem, right? So. <laughs> All that, life forms have. Yeah, that, well, the, the, that was the, kind of their problem, and I think that um, <laughs> they may be like dinosaurs. Know, but but George also sort of I thought did a, a good job of talking about wh what the disruption is going to be, and that is measurement of learning outcomes. And digital badges are measurements of outcomes that employers can look at and say, now I I can understand whether this person can close the books or or program a router or whatever the the skill is that that is uh, is demanded. Um, a, a university degree is, has mainly signaling power. That is, you say, somebody graduated from Duke, they must be pretty smart. But of course, we all know that there's a wide range of skills among people who graduate uh, from Duke or from anywhere else. So, uh, you know, when, when disruption happens, it can happen quickly. If you all remember when President Obama was inaugurated, there was all this talk about he's going to keep his Blackberry. Right, and you know, Mr. Cool President was going to carry his Blackberry with him. Well, now who has a Blackberry? And that's only three and a half years ago. Now, universities have all kinds of, uh, you know, tradition, brand, a funding structure that is supportive of the existing uh, system and, and regulation and accreditation. But if employers ultimately want skills, and uh, universities are not able to prove that they're delivering skills. They have an issue, and so I guess, Lori, I want to ask you a question. Um, you talked about about universities understanding their publics. Uh, Syracuse University is a good example of a school that um, where there's a new provost who came in and said, you know, upstate New York is kind of dying, and if we, Syracuse, the the biggest and most prestigious institution in upstate New York don't do something about it, that's going to affect us. That's our, our public, our, our community is dying. So instead of attracting a bunch of kids from Long, Long Island and New Jersey, we want to attract students from nearby. And that's going to mean that SAT scores are going to be a little lower, and the prestige of the university might sink in the way these things are thought about. And she was just flooded by alumni, by faculty, by you know existing students saying, you're destroying Syracuse University as we know it. And so we can try to, you know, universities can try to understand their, their publics, but there are very powerful constituencies that keep them from actually doing anything sure. about it. I'm wondering if you think that it's realistic to think that universities will, in fact, adapt, or will they adapt like the dinosaurs do? Yeah. Um, I, well, I certainly hope not. Um, my, my, I think what Syracuse University did was, was really brave. Um, and I think part of what university, one of the major drivers um, is the U.S. rankings, part of what you got in, in the pushback in Syracuse had to do with the, the U.S. rankings question. Um, universities did fine before U.S. rankings. Um, and that's something that I, I would want to push against in terms of whether all of those metrics are the right metrics. And what she did was say, you know what, guess what? We are thinking very differently around 
metrics in general. Now, um, she also wanted to create a very large kind of change right away. My approach would be much more incremental. Um, I think there are, first of all, a public doesn't always equal nearby. I think there are other kinds of publics. Um, international publics are phenomenal forms of publics that I think we've only begun to figure out how we work with. Um, I also think that um, th th this whole question of um, the badges and the bundling, one of the interesting things that we could do much more efficiently and differently would be create partnerships around those badges with corporates. Um, with, uh, you know, foundations, with any number of other places that would allow us more integrated conversation of how we're getting educated and the place for which we're getting educated. The one thing, so that would be the way I would respond in terms of, a, and, and, and it's going to look different depending on what the public is, um, and that's why we always have to talk about it in the plural. Um, I, the other thing I would say is that I think that the badges is a wonderful way to go for skill-based knowledge, but the key thing that we're also seeing that really needs to be part of this conversation is corporations are more and more, med schools more and more, are looking for people with liberal arts degrees. Now what's going on with that really interesting shift in demographic? Um, if you need to be skill-based and you need to be more accountable around skills, and I think you know people within universities are seeing that in all sorts of ways, as are multiple publics, but integrative intelligence, it's a whole, uh, other question, and I think it's important that that can also be measured, um, but I think it can be taught in a number of different ways, and I wouldn't want to um, only focus on the badge for the integrative intelligence. That would be the way I'd respond. If I may, I'd like to give George a chance, and then we'll yeah, preserve sorry. a little bit of time for yeah, yeah. questions. Yeah, I just have a couple of quick quibbles. Now, this might be like one of the last vacuum tube <laughs> televisions, <laughs> but I do have a Blackberry. Um, the quibble number two with, with Andy. He mentioned, and this is part of the conventional wisdom about higher education in America, is that uh, more and more jobs require college degrees. But require in what sense? I don't think it's true that more and more jobs are so intellectually demanding that the incoming freshmen at Duke or even UNC can't possibly learn to do them. Instead, what we have is what we at the Pope Center and other places refer to as credential inflation. Over the years, there have been so, so many people entering the labor force with college degrees that employers have adjusted the way they screen people. And they say, look, if you don't even have a college degree, you won't be considered for jobs like, here's a good example, doing the uh, counter work at a rental car place. You now have to have a college degree. It's required that you have a college degree to apply for a wide array of jobs that really don't call for any advanced knowledge. They're just looking for some indication of trainability and reliability. Well, there have got to be cheaper ways to provide those indicators than a bachelor's degree. Yeah, if I can just respond sure. to that, because I think I, I, I agree with what you're saying, George, that the, the degree is a totem. It's, it's intended to indicate something, but it actually doesn't indicate much of anything. Learning and measurement of learning is what will ultimately drive uh, where we want to go. And the, one of the difficulties we have as a country is that we invest in education because we think education has a return, but that investment is being dissipated into all kinds of things that have nothing to do with education and the things I described at High Point. And frankly, as you walk around the campus uh, here at Duke, there are a lot of things that have nothing to do with education. And so we may think that relationships, place, and experience are important. But the question is, is you know, the taxpayer who's spending hundreds of, of billions of dollars on education, are they really investing in place and experience and so on? And you can, you can find reasons why, it, why it's good. But ultimately, uh, university, a university experience is a bundled product. You cannot buy a Duke education without buying the basketball team, the gardens, the uh, pavilion at the, you know, in Perkins and so on. You have to buy all of it. And so if you could just buy the classroom, it would be dramatically less expensive because I, you know, every time I come here, I walk into, you know, or, or at least buy a classroom. And, you know, those of us who are here for our 30th reunion, those of us who are here for our 50th reunion, we would recognize the classroom. It's not that much different. There's a whiteboard in front instead of a chalkboard, and there's a, there's a faculty member. It's not that expensive to deliver. It's the bundled product nature of it that, that raises the cost. We already have a question, so I'm going to go ahead and open this up now um, for conversation. We do have microphones, um, and it'll certainly ease the, 
the sound for the web people listening on the webcast if you use the microphone. So please, um, the, one of the students will be bringing a microphone to you. Uh, the question that, is this on? Yes, it is. <clears throat> the question of, of what is the value of the college education that, as you're talking about the rental counter or, or, or just having that certificate, um, I, I don't think of it necessarily as skill sets, although there are some skill sets, but presumably if you're going through Duke, you're learning to think. And so if I'm hiring someone who's, who has a degree, I'm going to generally make an assumption that they have learned to think and, and to figure out things better than if they had not gone through that experience. So I think there, there's something to that process of taking minds and, and molding them into uh, how you go about figuring out and problem solving. I don't know if there's a question in there. But <laughs> <laughs> I guess, I think, if, if, uh, sorry, I'll yeah. just give a, a brief response to that. I agree with everything you said. The question is whether all the things that come into the modern university are in fact furthering the goal of making, enabling people to think. We do want people to learn how to think, but are there more direct ways of, of accomplishing that goal? And I think, Andy, your critique is, is very important. Um, my way of thinking about it is what a wonderful sociologist Thompson talked about is the clumsy solution and the messy marketplace, right? So one of the things we might think about is, yeah, you, you can buy a classroom, and lots of folks in Asia can buy a classroom. It's interesting that they're buying those classrooms, but they're also buying something bigger, which suggests not only integrative intelligence, but multiple intelligences. And there you do need you know, relationship, place, and experience. Where we are dinosaurs, and where I think George and Andy are right, is assuming that every form of human flourishing requires a BA in exactly the way that we've been talking about before, the, the high point experience or whatever we might be talking about. And what they've been kind of very compelling around doing in their lives and in their writing has been talking about the ways in which we do need to think about skill-based knowledge more efficiently. And I think the university is, is really a, trying to adapt quickly, not only at Duke but at other places, precisely to that idea. Um, but where I would disagree probably would be that we actually need to look at multiple possibilities of um, forms of education that are available in the marketplace. Um, and th th therefore, relationship, place, and experience is going to be something that people will want. And even there, we need to make that also more, more, more affordable. I wouldn't want to create an either or where we have the integrated multiple intelligences and then the skills based knowledge, because then we're back to you know, some of the very tough um, class issues and vocational issues that I think we're moving away from in the digital age. Mm -hmm. uh, very quick response. Yes. At one time, it was true, back when I was an undergraduate in the 70s, you couldn't get out of college without considerable development of your mental faculties. Today, you can. Many students do. Uh, as Aram and Rocks have found in, in that book, Academically Adrift, a large percentage of students go through college essentially gaining nothing with respect to cognitive abilities. But we nevertheless have this barrier now against people who may have the thinking abilities but don't have the credential that costs a lot of money. Next question. OK. This is actually more a, a comment on something that Mr. Leaf said and indirectly what um, Dr. Patton said. Um, my husband came here to Duke to do his graduate work and got a PhD here. But he came out of the European university yeah. system. Yeah. And I just wanted to comment on the MITx comment about how you can go online and get credentialing through, through um, a wonderful place like um, MIT. The university system, um, state-run university systems in Europe, you are basically schooling yourself. You can either attend uh, coursework or you can read the, your book but there is no testing throughout the semester. The only test you do is an oral exam with your professor at the end of each course. And there, it's offered once or twice a year. You don't have to do it at the end of the course. You can wait a year. You can wait six months. But your only opportunity to pass that course is through an oral exam for each course you take. And that's how you earn your, your um, uh, undergraduate degree there. And um, I just wanted to comment on a way of, that's a very low cost education system, but you have to have a lot of drive and a lot of um, self-control to succeed in that system. But it rather reminded me of the MITx model. Well, <clears throat> a a 
actually, that, that's a wonderful point. When I went to law school here, I had a lot of classmates who didn't go to law school. <laughs> they, st they studied Gilbert's, uh, or the law school equivalent of Gilbert's, the, the handbooks, in their, in their uh, apartments. They never came to class. And some of them beat the stuffing out of me on the exams at the end of the year. Uh, there, there's, there's more than one way to learn something if you're motivated to do it. And, and being in a classroom is not necessary or sufficient for a lot of people. Which I think is why, as Lori said, Duke has been experimenting with the flipped classroom. This Absolutely. is something that we've been spending a lot yeah. of time on. Um, uh, just to say this, uh, the extreme of example of that is um, a, in a small village outside Pune in India where I do much of my field work. Um, there is a Vedic college, which is a traditional college of Sanskrit learning, that has, it, it's the, it would be you guys' dream, actually, because it's the opposite of credential inflation in every single way. It um, has tested every single well-known Sanskrit professor that I know and their teachers and their teachers' teachers, and it has not um, allowed a single one of those brilliant minds to pass in 50 years. It has flunked every single one. Um, and it's really proud of that. You yeah. know? In other words, and everyone goes and tries you know, one more time. Uh, but the, the, the reason why I bring up that humorous story is that I think we're always going to be dealing with inflate, uh, uh, inflation of credentials or credential inflation in some way or other. And I think even the measurements that we come up with now um, that are seem rigorous, um, will, there will be ways of gaming that system. There will be ways of you know, pushing those credentials. So I think the key thing for educators is always to be figuring out um, in, and anticipating in what way the rigorous credential we think about now could be uh, inflated later. Yes. Uh, in Singapore, the government's researchers figure out what are the jobs that are going to be necessary for the next three, five, or ten years. And then they rely on the education system to provide education to people so that they can fill these jobs. Now, do you see a role like that in our education system? And maybe we wouldn't have these three million jobs that, in America that nobody can fill? I'll, I'll respond to that. The, um, I don't. I don't see and I don't hope for a role for the, the federal government to decide what the economy needs. But I think that uh, over time, as we get better at the measurement of learning outcomes, those institutions that can prove that their students learn will gain market share relative to those who can't. And, uh, and it's going to be employers who become effectively the accreditors because they're going to demand that students have, uh, have demonstrable uh, proof that they can do certain things, and they're going to, uh, and students are going to flock to institutions that can deliver that kind of uh, demonstration. Mm -hmm. um, you I don't see the federal government's aid to education should have any correlation to job oh, outcomes. Well, I actually, you I mean, if I if I can continue for a second, sure. One of the key problems that we have is the government does not distinguish between excellence and mediocrity. You can invest mo government money in classrooms or in climbing walls, and the government doesn't care. And it seems to me that we, that when from a funder perspective, we ought to be saying that a, that a uh, uh, an institution must be investing money in learning outcomes, access, affordability, or accountability. Those are the key values of our higher education system. But our funding, both at the state and federal level, just hands money over to the universities and says, do with it what you wish. And that is, that's a recipe for exactly what we have. Next now, question. If I could briefly comment. I, I don't want to see top-down government educational planning any more than I would like top-down government housing planning or energy planning or anything else. Better leave that, the decision-making up to individuals and educators and employers, and they will all figure out in competition which is the best way for people to go if they want good jobs. I, I would say one thing that I think is very important, and it's a slightly different version of what you're talking about. Um, I agree with Annie that demonstrable knowledge is crucial. Um, I think there are forms of knowledge that we measure less well and can be measured less well. Um, and I think we always need an educational marketplace to make room for those and sometimes in certain forms of educational environments make those a priority. Um, that being said, what I think would be really, really interesting, um, if we had the kind of robust 
bi-directional um, conversations and even um, not just corporations, you know, a lot of times when people hear Andy or somebody else say, well, the corporate, you know, employers will be the accreditors, people have a kind of soulless picture in mind. That's not the conversation that I'm seeing in higher education. I'm actually seeing really cool um, NGO folks who want to employ in some interesting ways, really cool foundation folks, really f cool corporation folks, really cool social entrepreneurs within corporations as well as without outside of corporations, um, asking education and educators and wanting to be in more robust conversations with educators around specific um, I, skill sets as well as dispositions, and I think you do need to distinguish between a skill and a disposition. What's really interesting that people haven't really talked about very much is a lot of those are not simply technical. They're quite humanist in their perspective or social scientific or whatever they might be. So I think we need to trust the conversation and support the conversation between all forms of employers and universities better. Let's get in at least one more question. Yeah. Yes. I'd like to try to get to the, what I think is a, an underlying assumption for some of this discussion. And that is, to what extent is a Duke education and a Duke undergraduate degree intended to make the recipient more employable? Yeah. Well, go ahead. Well, I guess I would say, um, first, you know, where, who, who's funding? Because if, if families want to fund you know, uh, people learning to do anything, to cook or to paint or whatever, then, then that's great. But the, the, a lot of the money that comes through a Duke and even more that goes through a public institution is coming from taxpayers, and the taxpayers are doing it because they expect a return. It may not be a, a strict financial return. It can be you know, better citizens and uh, you know, a, 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 a better society, but um, only 50, you know, with, even with that, that you, know, you say $54,000, but I pay the bills. It seems it's closer it's to, I can tell you, it's, more than, it's close right. to $60,000. Uh, tuition revenue is only 15% of the revenue in Duke's budget. The rest is coming from uh, contributions, income on endowment, and big chunks of, of government money. And I, th I frankly think it's legitimate for, uh, for taxpayers to say, what is the return on that? And employability is an important part of that measurement. It may not be the only thing, but it's an important part of it. And when we talk about you know, measurement of outcomes and the fact that all, all learning outcomes are not measurable is not an excuse for measuring none of them. You know, we should Absolutely. be measuring what yeah. we can and understanding that it's going to be imperfect. Yeah, uh, tuition, the percentage of tuition revenue for a Duke undergrad is a lot more than 15%, just to let you know, it's, it's much higher than that. So uh, for all of Duke, which is structured in a very different way. Yeah, well, I'm not I'm excluding hospital from, all, from those yeah, numbers. Yeah, but even but all it, of Duke. I'm just going about what's on the website. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a much higher for, for the BA. But what's interesting, I think, for, in what you're saying, is the Duke mission is critical humane thinkers to employ their knowledge in service of society. That is the Duke mission. It's not about employability, right? So. Um, the question I think that everybody on this panel is wrestling with is what does it mean to be able to do that? And what does it mean actually to employ your knowledge in service of society if you, what you come out with in the end um, is not necessarily the knowledge that society needs? Um, and that's where the key issue of integration is absolutely essential. Like just as a parent, I, there, I got no disclosure statement saying, by the way, Duke is not interested in employability. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the implicit message was, your daughter's going to come through Duke and be able to get a job and provide for herself over the course of the rest of her life, because I know what the alternative is to that. So, <laughs> so I, think that, I think that it's, we, 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 Duke can't, you know, sort of tap dance away from the fact that an important part of what we all expect out of Duke is that people will get the skills that can enable them to be successful in the workplace. Quick comment. Sure. Uh, I'm all in favor of liberal arts education. The trouble is an awful lot of young Americans aren't interested, and if you make them take the courses and make their parents pay for it, it's, it's pretty much a waste. Maybe later on in life they will find that they are interested in the fine arts and in literature. And there's so many ways today you can get into those things without taking any college courses. You can go and, and get the 
excellent lecture sets from the teaching company if you want to know about the Byzantine Empire or Beethoven string quartets. So let's not think that college is it when it comes to liberal learning. It isn't. There are lots and lots of other ways, and if people want it, eventually they'll find their way there. Um, we have reached the end of our allotted time, and I know reunions runs like clockwork, and they won't thank me for, for keeping you longer. Um, I think that some of our panelists may be able to stay for a few minutes if you wanted to talk with them directly, but please join me in thanking them for their time and their contributions today. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.